So yeah. All right, we're starting to record now. I'm here with Gina de la Chesne. Am I pronouncing yeah. your name correctly? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. How do you how, how am I supposed to pronounce it? It's Gina. Um, and then my last name is de la Chesne. Oh, Gina de la Chesne. See, I was the one language I've never been good at is is French origin stuff. Like, because it's too many silent letters and things like that. I was I was actually watching um. I don't know if you've seen that thing on Netflix There's called The Serpent. Um, it's about this guy who was like a practical serial killer, if that makes sense, in, in like Thailand. Like he didn't do it for a psychological reason. He did it to keep his illegal gem selling empire going. Like, you know, and, and so... <laughs> He was like French Vietnamese anyway. And like, so he spoke a lot of French and he had this woman who he was his accomplice, who did a lot of it with him, who he kind of brainwashed to his French Canadian. And the whole time they were speaking French throughout the movie, I was just like, I, I don't think I hear any consonants. Like, <laughs> right. right, right. It's very different than like German. Yeah. Right, where it's all consonants, you know, like it's, it's just interesting that way. And Spanish is kind of like, Spanish, uh, you know, it, as I found is, is, it's like, I found that it's, not so much that the talk is faster it's more that it's more condensed they just fit more syllables into one sentence than we do in, right, in they also have sentence. like 10 names <laughs> right exactly exactly yeah um but no it's so good to have you on um and uh you do so many things i'm gonna just read off a few of them to people here if that's okay with you that's um good. yeah just give me a sec here oh my god i lost it wait no i didn't hang on <laughs> oh here we go okay so I wrote like a little bio for you, I think, so I could probably in use as the introduction, but I think I might just read it here. Um, Jinnah is an extremely experienced martial artist, yoga teacher, and trauma recovery counselor who incorporates Buddhist philosophy into her practices and has led and participated in humanitarian efforts in the United States and abroad. In addition to serving as the founder and director of the Nashan Project, am I pronouncing that correctly, Nashan? Nashan, yeah. Nashan, okay. And the trauma resource director for the International Center for Mental Health and Human Rights, she has also played key roles in initiatives and organizations such as Second Response, The Lineage Project, 108 Lives, The Three Jewels Outreach Center, etc. Jenna is an alumna of the 2017 Harvard Global Mental Health Trauma and Recovery Certificate Program and has served as a visiting lecturer for the Columbia School of Social Work, NYU, Baruch College, as well as the Uganda Clinical Psychology Association and the Uganda on the Behavioral Health Alliance and, and the University of, oh, at the University of Kasubi, excuse me. Um, is it Kisubi or Kisubi? Kisubi. Kisubi, okay. And she also offers online courses and trainings on her website. She has also made contributions to the Huffington Post, New York Yoga and Life Magazine, and Yoga City NYC as a writer and photographer. In addition to all this, she serves as an associate producer for the Tibetan Stories docuseries, has her own private practice at the Iris Kaplan Center for integrative mind body health and transformation and as a mother to two girls now i don't have to record a separate intro <laughs> thank you i appreciate that and the iris kaplan center has has morphed into the therapy collective gotcha okay yeah so where would you like to start out of all of that <laughs> i don't know i don't... <laughs> um i think with the nachen project you know because okay. i just um I just launched the website today. Okay. Uh, so it's a brand new website uh, focused. Oh, so it's not the one I was looking at. You relaunched. We were it. looking at my website. Um, oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. And so Nichen, uh, the Nichen website, I'm, you know, the founder and the director. I'm part of a team of people mm -hmm. that works to support the women and children in Ketchway. Right. The slums of Kampala. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, starting there would be great because uh, that's been my focus. Uh, that's my focus almost every moment of every day, aside from my children. And then okay, the so it, is Natan a word in the local language there? It is. I um. So in 2018, and I had already been to Uganda a few times before that, but in mm -hmm. 2018, it was the first time I'd spent time in Katwe. Okay. Uh, I'd been to Kisenyi before, which is another slum, and spent mm -hmm. some time there. And in in Ketwe, I spent some time with the women, mostly the women. There were not very many children uh, that time, 
uh, that were part of the group. And I just shared practice with them, you know, uh, okay. breath work. It was just breath work because a lot of right. the women had so many different physical ailments. Um, okay. And then, and they wanted to do more and, and they wanted me to come back and, and they named themselves Jinnah's Women's Ugandan Group. And I was like, that's, that's, not as that's great, but no, 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 no. Because I'm very aware of this um, kind of the continuing continuation of colonialism, basically. I was going to say the same thing. It's like they've caught, they've used, they've, by stamping your name on it, they've colonized themselves. Right. And that's, that's, uh, that's a system that happens a lot in, and I can only speak to Uganda and Kenya. I can't speak to other countries in Africa, but it is a system that we can talk about. And so I asked them to please. Consider, Almost like charitable imperialism. Yes. And it creates systems within systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked them to please consider naming it after somebody in their community. And I said, you know, the group is not, it's not my group. You know, it's a right. group of people, our group. our group, and they named it Nachan. And Nachan mm -hmm. in the Karamajong uh, tribe uh, means mm -hmm. someone who comes into the community and helps to uh, helps to remove the suffering of others. Which, okay, so like a healer then, sort of. Kind of, yeah. I mean, for me, I the parallel that I see is. Uh, in a bodhisattva. So if anybody's familiar with gotcha. Buddhism, a bodhisattva is somebody that is promised to stay and help relieve the, the suffering of the world. Like, like a super Buddha almost. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's like probably really reductionist, but... They have, they have capes. I imagine myself yeah. with a cape often. Um, <laughs> I, awesome. think, I secretly want to be Captain Marvel. <laughs> That's so secretly. Yeah. So that's how the name came about. And it and it's interesting because, you know, in Uganda, there's about, I think, 33 different languages, different tribes. Yeah, because so, in Africa, it's not it, the Europeans really drew the national borders. It's but in, in the countries, it, if I understand correctly, it's really more division along tribal lines. Yeah. Yes. And, and countries as well. Um, OK. And um, so Nachan means that to the Karamajong, but in mm -hmm. Ugandan, Nachan means poor person. That's interesting. Yeah. That's actually really interesting. This is why I love, I, I've actually talked about language even with like a lot with a lot of my guests. I think it's so fascinating because I think it really does shape perspective and also show the perspectives of certain cultures. Yeah, of course. I mean, everything's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like, I mean, the, the example I always use is how we can tell how Spanish speaking cultures view the concepts of patience and hope because of their, their, their you know, they use the same verb for it, esperar, which is just, which is, it means to wait or to hope. And that in a way tells, now, when I, whenever I mention this to people who speak those languages, they're like, yeah, it, does, it just means there's things, so don't read too much into it. But for me, it's like, it, it's like, Oh, so patience and hope are two sides of the same coin, and they're just like, sure, <laughs> if you want to think that, you know. <laughs> but, but like, it, it, I, I feel like if we do look at the way that a lot of cultures approach certain concepts, the way their language shapes them does shape their approach in a lot of ways, or at least, if, if if not presently, then at least historically. Of course, and I, I, I mean, I say that of course, but like, you know, my, I'm half Mexican, and mm -hmm. I was. Spanish was my first language and then it became English because I got teased for speaking Spanish. Oh, and, that sucks. You know, that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. When you're a child of, of both countries. And right. um, I know for me, the when I am more fluent in Spanish, it's when I begin thinking in Spanish. Yes. And it's an entirely different way of thinking than in English. Mm -hmm. it's a different it's a different color it's a different rhythm and of course it is because the language has a different rhythm and you behave differently as well so well not you personally but i've found that when i speak another language sometimes i behave differently in spanish oh, i sure. can be a little bit more gregarious you know i'm a little bit i'm a little bit more like, like jovial and stuff you know, that's typically what i'm writing though because when i'm actually conversing with someone i'm just trying to get the words right i i'm i'm biliterate in english and spanish but i would not call myself bilingual if that makes sense um yeah. But, uh, you know, but yeah, it's, it's like the type of thing where just, 
you know, Eng- like English, I found when I'm in a when I'm in a close relationship with someone who's bilingual, I find that English is the stuff I use for like serious conversations. <laughs> like it's like it's when I'm like, okay, I really need to talk to you. Like, <laughs> right. or, whereas Spanish is more like my fun language, and I think it's because there's a novelty for Spanish for me since it's not my first language. Yeah, and there is more of a music to it as well. You know? Yeah, and, uh, and that's kind of. Uh, there's underlying rhythm in how we move, how we think, how we perceive, and even our voice. And, and yeah, in our voice and how we interact with different cultures. And, you know, for me, whenever, wherever I am, whether it's in a, in a gym or in the slums or in Nepal, I tend to adapt to how right. they move their bodies, how they speak, it's right. unconscious code switching. It's a survival skill. That, yeah, that, that too, absolutely. I would say that a lot of people probably view code switching as a survival skill now that I think about it. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, like I, I know that um, there's times where uh, I will like, if I, yeah, but it, the thing you mentioned about thinking in the language, that definitely makes a lot of difference. And, you know, it also affects, I think, just... Yeah, I think I think wherever we are, it affects how we act, and whoever around affects how we act, whether we are aware of it or not. Um, well, yes, and then that that actually comes down to nervous systems. I mean, everything mm-hmm. is space, but we are one of the things that I share with people is that we are constantly navigating the world based upon on how our nervous system is perceiving the world. Right. Yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely barking up my alley here. I, I, I tell people that um, I've been I think I mentioned to you before that I've been really exploring the Baha'i faith a lot recently. Um, and one of the things they have is this idea that I'm not sure how familiar you are with them, but is this idea that everyone should look should investigate truth independently. Like there is only one truth, but we all view it through different lenses. So we can only investigate it ourselves because so it's I don't I, I, I I've started ever since I learn that teaching I, I start to avoid the phrases my truth or someone else's truth the more I talk about more like the truth as I see it through my lens through my perception because I feel like we're all living through the illusion of our own perception and or well, it's not so much that we're living through it it's that we're limited to it because that is the entire truth for us when there's so much truth that we don't see mm-hmm. yeah and when we um especially in correlation to the work that I do when a lot of people have been traumatized. Um, and I say that because I'm, I'm a trauma survivor myself. I know mm-hmm. that we, we can tend to have, you know, a, we become myopic. Right? right. And that's another survival skill also because that comes from fear, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just too much sensory information. So we kind of shut down. And then when we, when we can open up means that we feel safe enough to do so. Right. It's, it's, I, I said something to someone recently where I, I said how, like, we wear armor to protect ourselves, but after a while it becomes really heavy to carry. Yes. Like, it's, it's just so, it, it's so difficult to just constantly live in that survival mode for so long because you're never really free. I feel like sur- survival isn't liberation. They're two different things. Mm-hmm. That's well said. Yeah. Um, but that, that gets me into, because you have done a lot of trauma work. Um, what got you involved in that? You said you're a survivor yourself. And one thing that I like to make the distinction between not because I, not to make anyone feel superior or inferior, but I think that there is a key distinction between the words survivor and victim. And I think that it's not so much choosing one word over the other in my experience, working with victims or survivors of trauma, it's more where their mind state is at. Like, I think that a lot of people are still stuck in that victim mentality. And as for a while, you should be, you have every right to be because no, that's just impossible not to be. And I think it's almost unhealthy to just jump into survivor mode instantly. But I think that it is a bridge that people have to cross. What was it that helped you cross that bridge? Um, Well, you know, I'm a survivor of my father's sexual abuse. That's one, Mm -hmm. one of the traumas that I've experienced. And I'm I'm a complex trauma survivor, everything from that to car accidents to right carriages to all sorts of as i put it fuckery um yeah that's a good that's a good word the the fuckery and i remember when i was in my early 20s and i was just kind of really beginning to grapple with 
what I had experienced as an adolescent from my father, mm -hmm. I knew very clearly that it, I did not want it to define who I was, that it was simply right. something I had experienced, but it wasn't my entire experience as a human. Right. And I, I could see how it could become, you know, the everything. And mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that lens, you know, it would be the lens right. through which you viewed everything if you weren't careful. Right. I mean, I also had the experience when I was uh, in high school of finding myself thinking a particular way about something or behaving in a particular way and recognizing I could choose not to. Right. Which is pretty extraordinary, you know? Um, yeah, it's like you, you start, you found a way to use it for awareness instead of action. I think that action, that action always has to come after awareness. And sometimes when we're aware of something, action isn't necessary because we already know it's coming. Right, and habituated responses. And I didn't, you know, right. I don't- uh, I like the terms you're using better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, neural pathways, habituated responses, you know, that's, I mean, that's what it is. And, and that's how it relates back to these ancient wisdom traditions, you know? Mm -hmm. I think you and I talked about this before in, in the Tao, the first line is the path is made by walking it. Right, exactly. It, 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 and there's another, I forget whether it's the same line or the, or the, or just a variation on that line. I think later on, it even has the whole famous quote about how a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step you know so right right and then that translates into neuroscience right. right yeah so could you describe how that translation works whether that's for you or just as you've seen it in people in general well which is both um because i am people in general too um mm -hmm. You know, I was speaking about this this morning, actually, with I led a loving kindness meditation class. I lead one every week for free. People can mm -hmm. donate. Chen. And somebody was saying that they were having trouble uh, doing the practice, not doing it so much, but like having the discipline. And, gotcha. and it all goes back to the same thing. It's like what you think, say and do becomes. And it also spreads outward in the world, you right. know. And so it's a training, it's a training for your mind. Um, and it's also, because I'm an athlete, I'm familiar with training the body. And so right. in these practices, we're training them together. Right, so did trauma, did that, did that, was that part of your inspiration to go into self-defense into martial arts? Well, you know, I mean, when I was a kid in Mexico, my brother got sent to do karate, I was five. Uh -huh. And I got sent to ballet and I got really pissed off. I was like, yeah, what? like this makes no sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in a family, uh, both sides of the family, you know, very patriarchal, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm an incredibly strong person who happens to be a woman. And Evidently. <laughs> and you know, I'm good with weapons. I'm good with my hands. I'm an athlete. I, you know, so it was something I always wanted to do. And then in becoming a martial artist, I liked the discipline of it. Um, I liked how the spirituality of it as well. Right. And also I had been playing team sports for so many years and I got so tired of like trashing my body mm -hmm. and other people not giving a fuck as much and so I was like yeah. and so you know like stepping into the ring is not unlike sitting down on a meditation cushion because mm -hmm. essentially the thing that is your greatest opponent is yourself right and, and and it's a very mindful experience oh yeah if you're not you get punched in the face <laughs> yeah. yeah that's <laughs> That's definitely, I think that's sometimes a more effective way to learn you're not paying attention than just someone <laughs> telling you you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I love it too, you know, it's, uh, I think that you and I and have talked about this and I talked about this in a self-defense seminar that I co-led last week with some of my fight buddies, but you know, there's one thing to be able to take a hit and then unfortunately too many people can take hits, right? Right. And then there's the other part of it is the, the ability to, to 
give a hit to punch somebody else. And too many people can do that too, disproportionately, right? right? But the ability to do both with skill and compassion, uh, that's being a martial artist. Yeah, and and it's interesting because, um, you know, like one thing, there's a couple things you mentioned I thought were really interesting there. One is that, um, you know, the whole taking a hit and giving a hit thing. If you can take a hit, you can be a punching bag, but you can't be a fighter, you know, like you can, I mean, because a punching bag can take all the hits at once pretty much until it, it would take a lot of hits to really destroy a punching bag, but it doesn't, it doesn't do what it needs for itself. You know, it's just there for somebody else. Um, and in my brief, very, very brief dabbling in martial arts, the thing that did shock me about it so much was how much of it was mental and like how much of it was like even even in the, in the few times I sparred like it was just and and so and the first time I sparred I, you know your test tested with a general it was kind of mixed martial arts so he tested me with you know just his general style like his natural style and then like he would have you pick a number and do um and based on the number I picked he'd pick a certain style and I would feel my body automatically adapt just to whatever his body was doing kind of like we talked earlier in a code switching type of setting except it's like code switching in a fight um the other thing that i've noticed it it was interesting that your brother got sent to fighting and your and you got sent to dancing because i've actually noticed a lot of similarities between the two as someone who's dabbled in martial arts and who has on a very amateur level like dabbled in dancing as well um like like urban dance and things like that and you know and and i've tried to I'm, i'm hoping to get learning into salsa recently but it's like if we look at movies, dances are choreographed and fights are choreographed. It is a bit of a dance to it. And the thing that really sold this comparison to me was when I watched the Aikido style, which is, um, I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. It's very, it, it's not super practical, but it is powerful when it is used correctly. It, it, and, and it's used, and it, I, it was like I was watching ballet. It really was. It was just so, there was such grace to it. And yet these people were getting thrown over people's shoulders onto the ground. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's interesting because it's all, it is, it's, um, there's some people I love sparring with, um, Mm -hmm. and it's like a dance. It's beautiful. It's fluid. And, and then there's other people, it's so discordant. Like a street fight. Well, a street, I mean, street fights are very different than anything that happens in the ring, you know? Right. that's a that's a same part of the conversation, but you know it's different. Um, mm-hmm. When you're doing uh, competitive combat sports, you know it's there is a there's a real beauty to it. Um, yeah, and you know it's, you mentioned the part about like being being a woman in these situations, and one of the things that was hard for me to get over was like actually having to hit a woman. <laughs> and it'd be okay because all my life I've been told never hit a woman and then like I'd have female you know like people in in the class who would get like pissed off at me like why aren't you hitting me I'm like uh (laughs) because I've been told my entire life not to yeah they're they're like like, well you need to hit me like it was disrespectful if I didn't hit them as hard as the men it is it is it's showing disrespect Yeah. yeah um also, because you're not helping them, you know. Right. There's one of the the phrases that my friend Johnny Johnny Salgado. He's a mm-hmm. um, he's retired now, but he was pro MMA and. Okay. I trained with him for years, and he would always use the phrase "steel sharpens steel." Oh yeah, 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 I've heard that before. Definitely, definitely. I actually like to use that. Um, I, I, I like to use a similar analogy when it comes to resiliency and it's that we, we have as people we have to be muscle rather than glass because glass it gets enough bruises in it and it shatters and it has to have someone else come fix it whereas muscle it just it, it breaks down when you exercise on its own and then it built and then but the struggle it's been through helps prepare it to regenerate even stronger um and that kind of it's it's the it's a very literal form of resiliency um and i i found in a lot of situations biology and objects often mimic spirit um and you know we we in yoga land uh Mm -hmm. the the pose that best exemplifies resiliency and Mm -hmm. one of my favorite to do with uh like like a hundred people because it's so beautiful uh is tree pose oh yeah yeah i like that right because tree pose if you're too rigid right you and a strong wind comes you fall over right and then 
and and I like I've had this experience in in Nepal, in Uganda, Kenya, wherever here, where you have a whole group of people together. It's like a stand of trees, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're all doing tree pose on their own, and some can nail it, and some are falling over, right? And then I feel like the wobble's almost necessary though. The, well, because your foot has to shift, right? The foot, yeah. a flat foot can't shift, right? So you learn how to really right. key into that. And then- You have to accept that you're going to wobble, right? Right, that, that that's the sway is part of it. Yeah. But then when you have people actually join hands and then close their eyes mm. and you can feel the sway as it passes through a hundred people and the strength of that. That's crazy. That's amazing. Beautiful. And because then, because it's an embodied experience, it's one thing to say you're stronger together. It's another thing to feel stronger together, mm -hmm. to feel supported. Yeah. And I, I think, and I think that, so I, I'm just, I've never seen you in, in a ring, although I think that that would be, that that would be fun to witness and maybe even fun to participate in, even if I get my ass kicked. But <laughs> I mean, um, one, I picture you as someone who's very level-headed in the ring. Not a lot of emotion, not a lot of, um, you know, like I think a lot of people when they, when they think of a woman fighter, they think of like an angry woman, but yeah. you, don't you don't strike me like, like just this pissed off woman who's going to kick their ass, but you don't strike me that way because I feel like the scariest people to me are the ones who it's like, you can't, either you can't read them or you can't make them flinch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, for me, like I remember a couple of years ago, I was helping um, this guy train mm -hmm. and he was a couple of years younger than I am, maybe even like more than that, five or eight years younger than I am. And he mm -hmm. was so frustrated because we were just doing some partner drills and little light sparring and he's so frustrated, right? right? And, and I'm like, dude, how long have you been doing this? And he's like, you know, almost two years. And I was like, I've been doing this for 20. Mm -hmm. Like there's just, I just know shit that it takes time to know, right? right? And so for me, like when I'm when I'm sparring, I like to play. I mean, I mm -hmm. also because it's a mental thing, right? So I definitely right. I like to fuck with people. <laughs> yeah, I I actually like doing that socially sometimes. Not like in a way where it's like I'm a, like some kind of person who likes to stir up trouble, but more like I one thing I it's more like one thing I really like doing is I love playing dumb with people or letting people think they have the upper hand. I love doing that with people because it's so fun because it's like, if I need to, because I never want to have to, to, to pull the, you know, card where how, this is how much I know. But if I need to, I always have that card in my back pocket and it's a card that they never know I have. Yeah, it's, it's being a counterfighter. I'm definitely a counterfighter. I wait to mm -hmm. see the openings. And then, and recently I've started like just really kind of mimicking a person's body movements because right. what I'm doing is I'm learning them. Could you, so could you explain a little bit more about what a counterfighter is? Oh, so also I'm a Southpaw. So that means that right. I'm, I'm a goofy foot, you know, when I surf or yeah. whatever, my, my right foot is forward. So that gives yeah. me a typical advantage over somebody that's orthodox mm -hmm. and you're working with angles and openings. So a counterfighter means that for me, typically the moment they extend their jab, right. Mm -hmm. I'll just come over it with my hook right. or, or for me, what I like to do is just knock it out of the way and come right back. Um, right. But it's, so it's, it's, I wait to see the opening. I'm also working with like their, how fast they are, how long they are, you know, and something that you said earlier in the conversation is that, you know, martial arts is such a mental game because mm -hmm. One of the things that works the best and that we're taught to do early on is to move into a strike. Right. Like, you, like when someone has a knife you're, and they're going to stab you like this, you have to move towards the danger to stop it. Right. I don't have a lot of what, uh, experience yet with weapons. I'm learning that now. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, like, I love being a beginner. It's really fun for me. Um, that's a great I, I i like that attitude because i feel like so many people just don't learn things because they hate not being the expert there's actually a great ted talk on that i should send you and maybe even post on the page um, yeah uh, i would love to i would love to to hear it i know i love it i and i love being wrong i love being wrong about people mm -hmm. 
you know? Yeah, well, I, I love being wrong about people when it's good for me to be wrong about people. But like, I, I love it when people surprise me. And one thing I like, this isn't related to fighting, but just socially, I love strange bedfellow situations. Like what? Like, like, uh, like basically, like, like two people who like start doing something together or they get in on something or they really get along well that you like wouldn't expect to get along necessarily. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought that was a more... That's like an odd couple thing. situation. Yeah, like an odd couple situation. Yeah, like, yeah, strange bedfellows, odd couple. It's pretty much the same thing, yeah. I right. love those. The, those, are, those are always just fun for me and they always just make me smile. Yeah. What, uh, what examples do you have of that? For some reason, I'm like, I'm like coming up blank on it, but like, like, this might sound weird, but like, I like the idea that like, me and someone who, could, I've always had this weird fantasy about like, like just having a fun conversation with a dictator like a brutal <laughs> dictator like like and making him laugh not because i'm like trying to impress him but more it's more like from a power standpoint like i have the power to make this brute this human being human being who is engaged in such degrading acts of inhumanity act human with me that's very interesting well you know <laughs> for me my my kind of parallel to that is like i would love to have an opportunity to share practice with the people in power yeah yeah because i know that if they were not suffering they would mm -hmm. have a cause to create more suffering for others right i feel like suffering is kind of an ego trip in a lot of ways where it's like even if we look at and this is something that people will probably disagree with me on and i don't I don't know what the exact proper solution is, but I think of the, the whole idea of like, you know, the student debt crisis and how some people are like, well, I didn't have my loans forgiven. Why should they have theirs forgiven? Like my, your life has to suck because my life sucked. So yours needs to suck too, for it to be fair, you know, instead of just viewing it as, oh, awesome. Those people don't have the same issues that I, that I would have. I, w I wish they'd done it for me. You don't get mad at the people who are having that done to them. You get mad at the people in power for not doing it sooner. Right. Right. And that's, there's a lot of everything that we just said, just in that last two minutes is all basic concepts of Buddhism, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I, I know that if somebody were truly happy and healthy and whole, they would want that for others and they would have no reason or cause to create harm for anyone else. Right. And we can, and so that's why I think we create caricatures of people in our society. Like I've had clients who buck so many stereotypes of like you know the lazy homeless person or the you know like the the um person who won't ever pay their fair share and things like that like I, I i there have been times where like i'll have someone who doesn't have a cent in their pocket and i will have you know it will have been on the company dime and it, 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 i can say this because i'm leaving now but <laughs> but i mean like so i'll just i'll go out and get them something to eat to eat it wasn't necessarily against the rules but it was like you shouldn't do it too often but these people would always be like I'll pay you back. I'm like, you don't have a cent in your pocket. You don't have to pay me back. It's fine. Like, just don't worry about it. Like, you know, just, I said, and, and then I'd eventually have to tell them if you do that, I will literally get in trouble for <laughs> you doing that. So, right. um, when it's that kind of thing, these are people who have nothing and they want to pay me back with nothing, with nothing that they don't have or something that they don't have. And it, it's people paying who you back with integrity. Exactly, with integrity. The integrity is so much more common than people realize it is if we try to appeal to it, if we acknowledge its, its existence within people. And, that, you know, that's, I, I say that to like when I'm working, especially with youth, you know, um, mm -hmm. in, in some of the most fucked up situations that the city can offer um, within a system, right? Within right. the Department of Education or the Department of Justice correction system. And and I ask everybody, I say, I'm like, what's the one thing that you can give yourself that nobody else can give you? Mm -hmm. And they kind of think about it. And sometimes they're like calm. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good one, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're like happiness. And I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good one. You can figure that one out too, you know? And mm -hmm. I said, the one thing that no one else can give you and which is really apparent in how you hold yourself is dignity right exactly. and then they're like you know mm -hmm. they 
they come into their own, you know? Right. Yeah, it, it's so true. It's because, and I've, I've just, I mean, I call, I call it whatever you want. I call it the divine image, you know, that, that comes from my Christian background where it's just like, that's the one thing we all have in common is this connection to something greater, this, this, this whole, this sum, this source, this unity, this union, whatever you want to call it, this God universe, whatever it is. Um, and our connection to that is the thing that we all share. It's, it's, and I just call it the, I mean, in the Christian Bible, it says we are made in God's image. I think people think that to mean like, you know, oh, well, I, this is how I, no, it means that we are representatives of the divine. Like we are representatives of the divine and we have, and it is how we behave that makes the divine look good. We can change this anytime we want within, with, within certain parameters, obviously, but the parameters we can't change are the aspect of God that he wants us to represent. That we can't change are the aspect of God that he wants us to represent. Like what? Basically, well, I, beyond physically I, there's a there's a there's this there's a statement in the unity movement which is different from unitarian universalism but it's similar in concept that each individual each human being is a different expression of the divine basically it's a different it's expression of a different aspect of the divine so we all have our own gifts physically we look the way we do because the the things that we can't change about ourselves physically i believe that god created us that way for a purpose there are things that we can change about ourselves physically whether it's you know our weight our body composition our um we can't change our height we can't change our we can't change our facial structure for the most part unless we're talking about non-natural means they're more cosmetic um but i think that basically we can change how we are but not who we are okay so everything that you just said so in in uh and i'm going to stick with buddhism and buddhism yeah. No came, problem. From, came from Hinduism, but in Buddhism, there's many different Buddhas, many, many, mm -hmm. many, many different Buddhas. Behind me is a white Tara. She is the female right. Buddha of compassion. Mm -hmm. 28 different Taras, right? And many different mm -hmm. Buddhas. And the idea is that each Buddha represents a quality within us. Right. You know? Right. So it's the same thing that you just said, but it's flipped around. No, and, and, and as someone who I, I now have a more omnistic viewpoint than I did a little over a year ago. So that def, I think that that's what, what, is, what we see in, in that conceptual, conceptualization is the same thing that we see in this other conceptualization here, it just being expressed differently, honestly. Yeah. I think that it's like, I mean, in, in, in Hinduism, the different gods and avatars that there are are also sort of like different just manifestations of Brahman and the Baha'i faith, it's, each each prophet of God is a different is the same spirit with a different personality, but is is the divine attributes being um being manifested upon humanity in Christianity? That's what Jesus is supposed to be. He's supposed to be the um. It's just in Christianity they limit it to one revelatory figure. Um, typically, I mean, and there's one like major revelatory figure. Um, whereas in other religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, I think that. I think where Christianity kind of, where, where I start to have some quabbles with it is the idea that they confuse the image of Jesus with the image of God. And I think that the image of God exists within Jesus, you know, like the image of God, it, Jesus is this, Jesus is the face of God for the time being, but he is not necessarily the son or the logos or the word or the Buddha spirit or, or an app or, or, you know, it's it's this i think that 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 has manifested itself multiple times throughout human history rather than just once right i would agree with you um i mean i was raised catholic and and for me um very early on it didn't make a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. i i was i was christian well i still consider myself christian i just consider myself christian plus basically now <laughs> like christian <laughs> plus a bunch of other stuff that i feel like when we really investigate truth further, we find a thread, you know? And, and the things I see that thread in, I believe in. Um, and the things I don't see that thread in, I don't believe in. And that might be kind of, that might sound somewhat arbitrary and it might sound like I'm making myself God, but if we believe in the Hindu belief that Atman or self or insight is God, then, I mean, is what I'm saying all that arrogant? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I get, I, you know, for me, there's a difference though, because Buddhism for me is the science of the mind. Um, right. And so, especially in how that correlates a bit to like quantum physics, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the duality. Well, if I perceive something in a particular way, it becomes that way to me, right? And right. This, we actually even started this entire conversation with that concept. We did, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so recognizing that you can choose how you see something. And it's as simple as, and I, I mentioned this in my, my uh, session earlier today, but it's like, you know, behind me is my altar and there's Buddha and there's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other things. And, and there's also cobwebs. And, right. you know, depending upon the state of my mind, I could look at those cobwebs and be like, God damn it. Like, I really need to clean, like, blah, 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 go off into that. Or mm -hmm. I could be like, holy shit, this beautiful little creature has, right. you know, with its own magic has spun a web and it changes what it is. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think transfer, I think that where the Western conceptions of religion falter in the eastern because I, I i there's there's beefs i have with eastern and western conceptions of religion in certain areas and in certain aspects and other aspects depending on what what you know characteristics we're talking about but one of the things i think that western conceptualizations of religions fall short on is that that it's like a friend described this to me it's like a report card type of religion like these are your grades you know, right. this is this right. is what that, that's to my friend Phil Ellis, who was my first guest, and I thought that was brilliant. Um, it's it's like we're trying to attain this level of perfection, but if we really read the read the texts of Eastern and Western traditions, that's not what it is at all. It's about growth. There's never this expectation of perfection. It's a growth mindset where we have where we're constantly transforming, and it's not and, and any trait that we have can become good or bad depending on how we use it. Right, and in in one or two for it, how would it say it, um, lineages in Buddhism, perfection's already here. It's not something to attain to. Right. Here. We just stray yeah. from it. We, we, or we just can't see it, you know? And, right. and I, and, you know, everything that we're talking about, like even the ability to have this conversation, if your mm -hmm. nervous system has been hijacked from trauma, right? Mm -hmm you are more likely to only particularly see one particular thing as opposed to be able to widen out and it's not, see not know? just that but your image of of the divine or god becomes lower i've i've met with in some cases i've met a lot of women who i've worked with who've been in domestic abuse situations where their abuser basically becomes like a god to them regardless of whether that god is good or bad it but yes. it's like and it's like they're the, omniscient the, all-powerful everything yeah, and that's an entanglement that has to do with attachment theory and the nervous system and, and how they're recreating habituated patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that, oftentimes good or bad is defined by that being rather than by their own insight. Yes, uh, and most likely also has to do with some kind of intergenerational trauma. Yeah, and I, I've, I've actually, I've been doing some pro bono consulting with a with a group that I, 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 because of the type of work we're doing, I have to be careful about the detail else I give in terms of identifying details. But one thing that we that I've mentioned to some of the people in that program is that being in an abusive situation, just as someone who, who from the outside looking in has worked on a lot of these cases, it's like being in a cult, except it's a cult with two people, you know, or a cult with a few people, just a very small cult. That person's your cult leader. You don't question what they say. They watch everything you do. I mean, even in situations that involve, you know, cyber stalking, Scientology does that. Scientology does that to their followers. They and it's intentionally noisy. In fact, in the documents of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard specifically dictates that the surveillance that they do on their followers is noisy. So their followers know it's happening to them, but there's enough plausible deniability that they can't prove it. Thus, it makes their followers look crazy for doubting any of, of for, for even questioning their authority. Mm. Right. And it's another way to, to keep that tether from one system to another, you know, so that that yeah that you're always reacting to that mm -hmm. sounds awful <laughs> yeah it is awful it's it's, it's, it's very absolutely awful. awful um but uh yeah but anyway so one thing i think that we talked on the we talked about the concept of the divine image and i think that you know i, I for a while for several years i was pretty involved in fitness i after i think a lot of us i, I remember 
I was in an on off relationship that just wasn't good for either of us. Um, and it ended around like, like in the summer of 2017 for about 10 months, I basically just, a lot of people would try to, I, I did basically the exact opposite of rebounding and just told my, I, cause I realized I had, I had never been someone before that relationship and that relationship lasted on and off about six years or five years or something where I never, basically what was my entire adult life up to that point, because I started it when I was 19. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, so before I got in that relationship though, I never was someone, one of these people who was desperate for a relationship or felt, didn't feel whole while I was single or anything like that, or even felt like, you know, I had to, I, I, I was never one of those desperately seeking people, you know, whether that was desperately seeking for a fling or for something firm, I never was one of those people. Um, but after, after that relationship ended, you, 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 that connection becomes so strong that it's hard not to turn it into an attachment. And I, I think that when we, that, that, I, I often describe the difference between attachment and connection is the difference between holding hands and or attachment is like being handcuffed and connection is like holding hands. Like you can let go at any time. If you need to come back to it. Attachment though is something you need. They're both, they're both intense, but only one is liberating. Um, and the other thing that was difficult about it though, was I realized how attached I was. And once I realized that I decided I'm not going to even engage in any sort of that type of validation from the opposite sex until I feel like I have created that validation within myself. And I never set a time period for it, but it ended up being around 10 months before I put myself out there again. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. I was single for a while, but I wasn't unhappily single. And I think I would have been if I hadn't done that. But where I'm going with this is that um, basically this idea of during that time <laughs> now I remember now I was I that was off on a tangent but I was um I was I had gotten into fitness though a little bit like I, I started getting back into fitness because you know you want to get that breakup body right I mean I wasn't necessarily going for the breakup body but it was more like I wanted to that was one of the things that I was told I was lacking in and I knew I had put on weight during the relationship and I wanted to focus on that again so I I got involved in fitness for a while and over the past year was the first time I kind of neglected it but this was the first time where I did not conflate my body image with my divine image you know because i feel i feel great i feel like i can lose this weight i've done it before you know i've weighed this much before i've lost it before and it's and i and and i did it pretty easily and so i can do it again it's the first time i'm not panicking but i see people and one of the things i noticed when i had this kind of um revelation about myself is that in the past i would have I've never, I've gotten black eyes. I've gotten kicked in the face. I've gotten, you know, rugby injuries. I've gotten gashes and stuff like that. And none of them have ever been damaged to my self-worth. But Mm. whenever I've been like, but whenever I've gotten put on some extra flab or something, or, you know, gotten a bit heavier than I'd like to be, or don't have as much muscle definition as I'd like to. um, and I've had people comment. It's not to the point where I've had people commenting to me like, you know, I never thought we'd see you look like this again. And they mean that in a very loving way. And I don't take offense to it. But it's just like I've started to have this realization of this is every bit as fixable as I, and I've posted this on my pages, putting as, as bandaging yourself when you get a wound, as putting on lotion when your skin is dry, as getting your, your hair cut when you feel like it's getting too long. Why, why do we approach this any differently? Why do we allow this to influence our self-worth? and not any of those other physical things that are very changeable. Well, um, there's so much in everything that you just said. You know, I think that the kind of underlying all of that, right? Because yes, mm-hmm. it's fixable. And I and I, I even, it's so funny, this morning I said in, in my uh, meditation class, I said, you know, physical injuries are so much easier to heal from than emotional ones. Right. Um, And I've had numerous uh, surgeries from sports and accidents, Mm -hmm. you know, the fuckery or just the fuckery of having a body. Right. Right, There's there's a difference between the fuckery of having a body and getting into accidents. Right. Versus someone trying to harm you. And that is, that is an insult to the soul. Right. And like when someone tells you you're fat. It's very different. It's hurtful. Mm-hmm. It's shame. You know, you feel shame. Um, and shame and humiliation are, are even often used as war tactics, right? Mm-hmm. Because it is. It's, and cult it's, tactics. And cult tactics. And in, in, um, by narcissists, you know, it's a mm-hmm. way of, it's, 
it, like I just said, it hurts your very soul. Right. Because that's, it's a, a separation from someone else's soul, right? And typically I'll right. speak in those, you know, words, but because it just fucking hurts, you know? Yeah, it does. It, it, it lasts, it like, you know, and, and in the past I've had people be critical of my body. And I think that's because I didn't have the confidence. I, I think it affected me more because I didn't have the confidence to change it. And so when I did, I held on to that change so tightly. And over the past year, since I've neglected this a little more, I thought I'd be panicking more because whenever I would even put on a little, even before this year, whenever I would put on even a little bit, I'd feel like I was starting to stray from that. I start panicking a little bit internally, but now it's like, no, I feel great. I mean, I said, I don't look the way I feel, but I can change that pretty easily. You know, like that's, and that's, it's just such a great mentality for me to have because I saw someone post on Instagram um, right after I made the post I did. And they talked about how there, it was a woman who talks about how her body goes through seasons. And I thought that was a perfect way to describe it. Well, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to, to point out is that if we can step back and watch, right? Especially women, because we go through seasons. We've gone through seasons since, you know, we were- You go through seasons every month. Every month. And then, but to, to kind of step back and watch, there's childhood, there's adolescence, there's being a mm -hmm. teenager, there's a young adult, then, you know, in your uh, 30s and then 40s. And I just turned 50 uh, in December. And right. it's really interesting to watch that change, you know, like- mm -hmm. But then there, the thing is, like, there's certain things that you can do, you know, like I can go to the gym and beat the shit out of the heavy bags and, mm -hmm. you know, scare a lot of people. But unless I get surgery or something, I'm not going to change the wrinkles on my face, you know? Right. Because that's just time. That's just being alive. Right. I can't change that. Um, but I can change how I perceive it. Right. And I've, and, and women in Hollywood who are like in, in their 50s or even even maybe 40s, but 40s, 50s, 60s, because I feel like 70s, 80s, people stop caring about the cosmetic stuff as much because they realize that there's not much they can do. But 40s, 50s, 60s, I feel like is that age where women in Hollywood get a lot of the work they get done, done. And I always think but the you ones see who ads on Instagram for people in their 20s and 30s are like, I use this. And I'm like, sweetheart, you don't need to. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> It's it, it, and like I always find the ones who don't seem like they've done that seem to age better, not because they like because in a photograph, you know, a lot of these people will look younger, but when you watch them talk on video, it's <laughs> and no, uh, and it's it's really it's it's unfortunate so much of what I mean, social media can be an incredible platform, you know, like you and I, I, I learned how it can be. Yeah, I had a lot of criticism before. Now I feel like I'm eating shit about it. <laughs> it can be an incredible platform for sharing. You know, I mean, everything that I do, as I mentioned, is is to focus energy and intention and awareness to the women and children in Nacham, you know, mm -hmm. who don't have the luxury of sitting around wondering how they're going to lose eight pounds. Right, because they're just focusing on surviving, living, being alive, staying alive. It is a in parts in parts of the world like that, if I'm understanding correctly, that, that often are subject to violence or war zones, it is a, you are literally, your entire environment is trauma. Yes. Yeah. And it's not PTSD. You and I think you, we spoke about this last time. It's not post. There's no post. It's continuous. It yeah, does yeah. not stop, you mm -hmm. know, and so what I'm trying to do is, is help them find a way to get out of those situations and mm -hmm. but you know it's like it's it's recognizing the things that you can change you've you've figured that out whether it's through physical activity or how you perceive a situation right right and we and you have the privilege to do that I have the privilege to do that and then there's so many people around the planet that whether or not they changed how they perceived it you know, they're still going to be living in the slums and, and maybe there right. does, but it doesn't change the systems of oppression that have created that in the first place. Well, and it's, I'm sure that by now you're probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the thing I find interesting about that is that it is, we, it's created as a pyramid, as a hierarchy instead right. of a loop when it's really more of a loop. I think in my experience working with people, I found that 
a lot of the times the higher needs can't get met because the lower needs can't get met. And also the lower needs can't get met because the higher needs aren't met. If you feel like shit about yourself, you don't feel like you have a reason to live. It's like, what's the point of me even taking care of myself? No one's going to care anyway, if I don't care. Right. Right. And until we really truly understand how deeply connected all of us are, right. You know, Truly, truly, and not just us, but every creature. I say as this bird just flew by. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, because we've completely neglected our own planet. We have, we have. The other thing I think is that, well, I view, there was a, there was a routine by George Carlin I saw, and I have there 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 are routine. George Carlin's one of those comedians where there's some things he says where I'm like I agree with literally every word he just said, and there's other things where it's like. I don't know, man, that's a, that's a little too cynical for me. But I mean, like there's but there's this one thing he talks about where and this it's a bit outdated, but he talks about this concept of saving the planet. And it's not I think a lot of people take it as anti environmentalist, but it's not. It's anti human ego. It's about like because he says, like, you're not saving the planet. You're saving. He said the planet is fine. The people are fucked. That's the thing. The things on the earth are fucked. Look, the earth has survived change after change after change throughout history. And so we're not really doing this to save the planet. We're doing this to save our own asses and maybe some other creatures along the way, but it's not that saving our own asses isn't important, but I think that sometimes we have to, we feel like we have to wrap it up in this thing that's so much grander in what we're, and I'm not saying that's what you were doing. I think you're just using the terminology that everyone else uses. Well, but, if it, but it also goes back to intention, right? So it's not just to save the planet so that our own asses don't get fried, right? Because this planet eventually is going to shake us off like a bunch of gnats, you know? Which is what he says in the routine. Right. And I remember that routine. <laughs> what yeah. it comes down to, when you consider that everything does spread outwards, because it does, mm -hmm. that's physics, right? Is the quality of intention in your mind. And it, it's the right. same, same thing that as people ask me all the time, they're like, why did you give that person on the street money? They could use it for drugs. And I'm like, look, man, whatever they use it for, you know, that's their choice. Behind it is my intention. Am I going to covet this couple of dollars, you know, or am right. I going to offer it and, and offer it so that I, in the hopes that they can be happy, peaceful, and safe and at ease. So could you speak a bit more on your experience with that? Because I have that, there were so many people who would always tell me like that they knew for a fact that like 98% of people, homeless people, if you gave them money, they'd buy it on drugs. And I just accepted that until I started actually working in the field I'm in. Oh, well, actually, it really, that started the, I don't know. I always was torn about it. I never really completely accepted it. Then I heard that Kendrick Lamar song, How Much a Dollar Cost, which was like, you know, it's the Matthew 25 story, basically. If you don't do this for this person, you, you've, you've let me down, as God would say, because I am that person. I am in all those people. Um, but like, then there's the, but then as I started working in the field, I saw how much that was true because like homeless people are not at all what we portray them to be. They're not this like this like, you know, animalistic, barbaric subspecies that just is hunting for drugs and change constantly. I would well, meet even, even that concept or that all of the language that you're using, it's a continuation of othering, you know. Exactly, exactly. Like, Which is I'm, I'm I'm using that language to make a point. Like it's yeah. because that's not that's not who these people are. It's this, it's this, it's this. First of all, when these people come through my door or across my desk or I walk into their homes, well, in these cases, they don't have homes. So when I meet them in a, in a public place, I don't instantly know that they're homeless. It's not like being able to tell that, you know, like that someone's missing a leg. It's, it's, it's not, the, and not that that would make them any less whole of a person anyway. It just makes them less whole of a body, but that's a different story anyway. Um, but anyway, the thing is that they would tell me they were homeless. And at first I'd be shocked. And after a while, it would stop shocking me because I'd realize oh, we're all pretty much an inch away from this if we look at statistics. Like, what's the stat that, like, 60% of Americans can't, like, afford an unexpected $500 expense or whatever it is? I don't know if those are the exact numbers, but whatever the number is, if pe and people can look that up for themselves, it's shocking. And I, I, I served on a homeless committee for a little while as well, for, like, you know, a, a community committee that would help out homeless people in the area. And one of the things that one of the women sat on the committee and I, I obviously won't say her name, but she said that she was homeless for a while, not in the traditional sense of like living on the streets, but more in the sense that she had to live out of hotels a lot. She had to, you know, go from place to place. She didn't have a stable place to live. And me spending just a month living out of hotels last year at one point, I can tell you that just the instability of that messes with your head in a way that I can't even imagine 
living on the streets or not having any roof over my head. Um, right, or the slum. Or living out of a car. And, right. and so it's just, but this, the, we create these images and stereotypes and caricatures of people to justify our own egos and our own selfishness and to make, our, to make, to force us not to look at our own shadows as, as Carl Jung would say, basically. Like we can't, we can't, anything that distracts us from our shadows, we will buy. We will buy into that or we will not buy by investing and we'll invest that dollar into getting our, into like, you know, getting ourselves a, a, a fucking skincare line or some shit or some surgery instead of giving it to a homeless person that we can invest it in and possibly their future. Right. Yeah. No, you know, one of my, my favorite things is like uh, every once in a while, you know, when you'll find like a $5 or $10 in your pocket. Right. You know, uh, because you're wearing like, you know, you first time you put on your pants from like last fall or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, if, you know, living in New York city, in the great before there was always the possibility of somebody asking you for money so it's like just offering them what i didn't even know was there mm -hmm. and you're offering them opportunity offering not them money. opportunity and i'm also offering myself opportunity for freedom of exactly. not being grasping onto that five dollars that i didn't even know was there right because and and i have this is <laughs> this is an entirely different discussion that I need to have with some kind of Bitcoin person or something. But I've developed the theory over the last few years that money at this point, that money isn't real. And what I mean by that is that I don't mean that like literally there's no such thing as money and that we can all just, you know, put the books away and stop counting. What I mean is that money has lost, has, 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 has traveled so far from whatever intrinsic value it once had that we can literally make it whatever we want these days there's no and i'm being proven right by that with all this bitcoin stuff and how yeah, that is and also there was this thing that my brother showed me where basically it was like this 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 financial guy in the wake of, finan of the financial crisis and they were like oh so how did you solve the problem he's like oh we just added another zero <laughs> like we moved the decimal place one place i'm like yeah oh, so you're saying he made it up he made up money like it's just this thing that only exists because we invented it. Yeah, I like the idea of the trading and the barter system. I do too. I think that just that became so hard to, I think it's, as we become a more, and I know this is a buzzword, but I don't care, a more globalist society, which I think is a good thing if we use it, if we approach it in the right way. But I think that, it's a, that bartering systems become more difficult to operate on that type of a scale. So we have to find some medium between it and going back to the gold standard, as my brother would tell me, would lead to disastrous results. So I don't know what the solution is for currency, but I hope someday we can do without it. We won't. <laughs> yeah, because then we even have to just redefine what currency is. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one thing that I'm noticing is I'm wondering if eventually with all this social media stuff, if, well, no, I'm, it actually has become currency now that I think about it because you can buy followers. Okay. So, you know, the contest that I'm in, right? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this... I need to vote for you in that. I just was, I was debating because I had someone else who's in the contest who asked them to vote for me. Can they like votes conflict or can you just vote for either person? You can I didn't vote know if I could vote both. twice. You can oh, vote. awesome. Okay, good. You get a free daily vote and then you can buy a vote. And the whole thing is if you buy votes, it's this crazy thing. It goes to support the Veterans Yoga Project, which is a legit organization. Okay. I actually, I, I, uh, I interviewed them like 10 years ago or something like that in an article I wrote. They're totally legit. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing with this contest is it's all social media and how you're, right. how you're utilizing it and the connections that you have and the algorithms. And then I literally have in my Instagram message box 25 messages from people that are like i'll help you win if you pay me 40 dollars right. to blah 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 and i'm like no and secondly this is all everything that i'm doing is to support my nonprofit organization like this is right. not about me you know i think eventually we're going to be trading followers with each other we're going to start saying i, I will give you this many followers if you give me this product you know, like, I think that's going to become a thing. I think that's people. already happening. I think that's you're probably right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because um, I had um, there was occasionally I dabble in music and things like that. And there was this time where I found this back in November where I found some of these old like uh, production stuff that I made in college. Like, you know, this old music I made in college. One of them was this was the only electronic 
track I've ever made. And, but it was, it was, it was like, it, and I listened to it again. I was like, holy shit, I made this when I was 19. This is good. Like, so I posted it, you know, and I had a promoter reach out to me on SoundCloud and said like, Hey, reach out to me on Instagram and I can help promote this. I'm like, yeah, sure. All right. And I thought that was nice. And so they said, okay, you have two options. We can either promote this like the organic way where it's like, we just post it on our page or we can promote this the way where we where we, like, we just give you a bunch of followers or, and some fake followers on SoundCloud and, boot, and, you know, boost your SoundCloud profile. I was like, no, <laughs> no, this is what I, that's what I thought this was like, you know, like, and just, it's all a construct. It's all, it's a construct. And I can't tell you how many young clients I have who literally their heads are like this, right? Mm -hmm. So they're walking around like phone zombies, but if they lose one follower, two followers, they dive into this depression. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I mean, a lot of people used to define their worth, by, people define their worth by money, by what's on the scale or now by followers and likes. And it's, it's this other, it, it's so interesting because I mean, there used to be, I can see when you're first starting out, like if you're trying to grow and you're worried about just any growth at all, I can see why your head might be buried in your phone. I, I was guilty of that when this podcast started, even though it was just a hobby. I just wanted to see if it was resonating with people or not, you know, but mm -hmm. when it comes to like, you already have like a thousand followers and you lose one or two you're doing okay. Like you're fine. I, I, I look at my insights from time to time, not as religiously as I used to, but um, you know, it's like, and there will be times where like, I'll have like, you know, because they have that net amount of followers that you gain or whatever. And it'll be like, I don't know what it was last week or something. It might've been like the last time I checked, it might've been like 30 something. And I think it was from like 50 followers and like 22 unfollowers. I could have focused on, Oh my God, 22 people unfollowed me. What did I do? But no, no, you might, it's, it's just the, flow of things like it's any, any anytime you put any sort of content out into the world you're investing yourself you're inv you're making an investment in your own expression and how other people react to that is going to be like a stock market buying or selling you know when it comes to your followers and um and i think that's just but yeah and, and losing that one follower or just this whole artificiality of followers or all that stuff it's just it's it's terrifying to me and I think that I would be a lot more, I'm going to be a lot more worried about it now that I'm going to be venturing into my own business. But um, yeah, the idea that these people are so buried in their phones or they get, and even the Zoomer generation, which is a generation below me that it's so devastated when they don't get enough likes on something. So they delete it, you know, like worst thing that's going to happen is you're not, I think part of that has to do with the fact that we are still in a very shame oriented culture, just from a different standpoint. Now, I think that our shame orients came from, our parents at first and now it comes from society like we wouldn't want to do anything that our parents wouldn't want us to do and i think just I, mean, I, think, I think that's because of so many people are living this extended adolescence you know yeah, yeah. and yeah. as you know you know in your adolescence you you move from it's everything is peer driven exactly exactly and and also well i think the boomer generation in a lot of ways their morality was governed by shame at least in in this part of the world but I think that the that there's a different type of shaming going on now, and it's more from, like you said, the like the peer driven thing. And I think that's where I, 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 I'm I'm an advocate for replacing cancel culture with curiosity culture. Like we learn about things, we're not afraid to be wrong, we're not afraid to be ignorant because I think that's what's important. I think that we that when we welcome if we're welcoming rather than trying to get anybody to like us, I just have had more experience in resonating with people that way. Yeah. And make it, like, I'll, I could say something really stupid in the wrong crowd, but if my reaction is, oh, what did I do? Rather than, no, no, what I did was fine. This, see, this is why, this is why you guys shouldn't have a problem with this because I'm on your side. See, I'm on your, like, if I, if I did that, then I would just look more disingenuous. And I think that's where a lot of my problems with cancel culture comes from is that it's, there's no opportunity for redemption, no opportunity for learning. We all are just, we all just are what we are and there's no growth. It's report card society, just like report card religion. Right. Well, that the term that um, my friend and, and my Qigong teacher, Thomas, always used is, uh, and which I share as well is, you know, are you judging or are you being curious? Exactly. Exactly. Because there are conversations I've had on this podcast that honestly I can say I've been pretty 
I've been pretty scared about either not being knowledgeable enough about it or I've been scared about saying the wrong thing. But if anyone, but then I come, and for a while I did worry about that, but then I comforted myself with it. Well, I mean, these other people who, if, if anyone does have criticism, I'll tell them, you do the interview then, you know, you, you do the interview, you ask the questions, you, you, you put yourself out there like I am, you explore these different perspectives and different people and different spirits and different minds like I am, and we'll see how well you do, you know, like, and, and see, and, or, but in, it's that, are you familiar with the Theodore Roosevelt quote about the man in the arena? Or I should say person in the arena, but the way he put it was man in the arena. Yes, I am. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that quote because that quote is all about growth mindset. Yeah. I'm, well, as a fighter, I'm very aware of that quote. Oh, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that makes you sense. should say it. You should say it for people listening. Do you remember I'm, that? I'm trying to remember it. I don't remember it line by line but it's basic I'll, I'll give the i'll summarize it. it's basically that um that the credit well i might post it just in the i'll read it as the outro i'll read it as the outro okay yeah because i don't feel like trying to memorize it right now but uh <laughs> yeah but i think that you are someone who absolutely is in the arena you're putting yourself in environments that you are not familiar with and you know i think that you're so I don't believe in ego death, but I do believe in ego management. I think that you're someone who you seem, you strike me as someone who has a similar mindset in that way. Ego management. Like, like basically ego death would be to deny that we have an ego at all, but I think we can't get rid of our egos. Um, I, I think. Uh, that yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, I know what you mean. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, to, to parlay that into how I live my life so for me Doctor. um tattooed on and i have a lot of tattoos you guys can only see a couple of them but um tattooed on this side of my body in tibetan is the phrase in liberating myself mm -hmm. may I benefit all beings right right so which means like can i get over my fucking bullshit <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and and really truly be of service you know <laughs> right right exactly and can i use my bullshit to be of service can i find a way to turn my bullshit into gold somehow that serves other people yeah because and also it's really important i found uh to laugh at oneself you know yep. i mean and not take oneself too seriously why which is why this contest i'm like for fuck's sake man <laughs> yeah well and it's just that I'm sure there's a lot of people who that contest it's like their 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 entire self esteem is riding on it. Yes, I believe so, and and I want to be very careful about not judging or you know. But there's a lot of people that I don't. There's a lot of people who are doing really really good work, amazing work. Right. And then a lot of people it seems they're very um, aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. um, optics. And I don't see what, how they are benefiting other humans. Right. It's, it's the difference between, I think, being in, do you want to be an influencer or do you want to be influential? Do you want to be a good influence? Do you want to be a, an influence in people's lives? Because I feel like an influencer is someone who literally it, it's become, it's become like a, it's become like a snake oil salesman type thing where it's just, you know, just it's, you're acting like you're doing this for other people but really you're doing it for yourself a real person who influences people who is influential does not focus on whether or not they are the one influencing people they focus on whether or not the influence is happening yeah 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 and i i personally like i uh hate promoting myself i don't really like it i have no problem mm -hmm. promoting the work like i have no problem promoting mind body practices and and the efficacy of them because mm -hmm. I know them and they, they work. Um, and especially I have no problem promoting the chat and that's the whole, the whole point of this. And, and all honesty, if I win great, but if I can get to the top four and just get mm -hmm. more people to see what we're doing and we're trying to do that, I'd be really fucking happy. Right. Right. And, and so you, you, you talked about the Nachan project. You've also been involved in some other things as well. Um, could you describe some of those other projects to people as well that you, that you've been in and maybe how it shaped why you created the Nachan project? Well, the, you know, they're all r related. When I, when I was younger, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, mm -hmm. And then I experienced some pretty severe trauma and became mm -hmm. an, a writer and a photographer. And, okay. and 
then I had a really hard time documenting the lives of people suffering without doing anything about it. It felt wrong. Right. I got a master's in photography, yeah. became a, a mother, okay. you know, and so now I spend time in different communities around the world, sharing practice, getting to know people, then taking their photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, in my photo uh, website, any money that's, that people buy the photograph of, it goes directly back to the community. But mm -hmm. in each of these different organizations, it's all about sharing mind-body practices and the understanding that you are your own resource. Right, right. And, and that, and that, yeah, because that's something that I've been having trouble as I, as I go out into, because the type of, the way that people form businesses now, networking and social networking is so important that um, when I've tried to explain to my family and people close to me what I'm doing, who are, who are a couple generations ahead of me, or sometimes one generation ahead of me, it's hard for me to explain it to them sometimes because it's like, so it, I don't have something the fact that I don't have something 100% concrete li lined up and I don't have everything planned out bothers them. It really bothers them and it concerns them, you know, and I get why, but I just, and I think that sometimes they think I'm, it's either my, my mania from my bipolar or they just think that I'm overconfident. It, but I have developed, I have reached a point in my life where I have full faith in my ability to provide for myself. However, I provide for myself, you know, like, however that is, I don't have, it doesn't have to be one way or another. I just know I'll find a way. I know we'll find a way if I can find the way, you know, like it's, if, if that makes sense, like it's just, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's so, it, it's so hard to explain to other people because a lot of people don't have that faith in themselves. And I don't have that faith in myself because I think I'm just, you know, so wonderful and so great. It's just because I know myself well enough that I know, what paths I can take and what paths I can't take and what will get me to work to, to where I want to go or whatever vision I might have. Right. Um, and it's something that I think people rely so much on other people to provide for them. Um, and I think we should accept help. I think that we're li that the people who are the ones who are overconfident are the people who say, I don't need help, you know, but if you're saying, if you're saying like, you know, I can do this myself and I'll take help where I can get it rather than I need to do all of this by myself, you know, I think that's when you know whether or not you're on a fool's errand or onto something that might actually lead you to growth. Right. And so the, the way that I'm reading that is also, you know, uh, you said in the beginning that Esperanto, yeah? uh, patience and hope, two sides of the same coin, yes. right? A good friend of mine, he always reminds me, he's like, Gina, hope is not a strategy. Right. Right. And so when I talk about the body ourselves as our own resource, especially in dealing with trauma, it also requires the the training to to do breath work, to do meditation, to do mm -hmm. yoga or qigong or, or whatever it is, dance, rhythm, anything mm -hmm. that's helping to restore the nervous system. Well, our natural yes. rhythm is our breath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to learn that you in connecting to yourself are the resource, which then spreads outward, right? Into the community. Because we all have, as Hinduism would state, we all have a piece of that source within us. We all have a piece of the ultimate resource within all of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if we yeah, find- but that I don't, I don't, when I go into different communities and we've talked about this, like I don't go into communities talking about Buddhism or Hinduism. No any of it or qigong you know i i first suss out a community but everything is secular because basically it's just neuroscience it's like right. notice what happens when you do this notice what happens when you do this and increase right. your awareness right absolutely i i think you know, because awareness is the key thing because whether we think that power comes from somewhere else or ourselves if it doesn't if there's none of it if we don't have any of it within ourselves then we have no ability but to rely on outside things that claim they are things that they may not be. Exactly. exactly. And that also goes to this whole idea of consumerism and social media. If you're always, I mean, that's what this is all based on. Social media is mm -hmm. based on like, let's point you towards this product so you can buy it because you feel so bad about yourself because you're comparing yourself to all of these other people that you feel you need to buy this product. So you're, so now you're right. happy, which is fucking bullshit, right? It is. 
So right. the idea is finding that within yourself again and again, and, and also through connection, honest connection with other humans, not attachment, as you said. Right. And you know, what's funny is I just realized that social media has kind of become, I think in, in, in the women's world, I think that's their dick measuring contest nowadays. <laughs> like men we already our dick measuring contest is like you know we kill each other but women it's like <laughs> how many followers do i have exactly yeah oh god yeah i have no interest in that game <laughs> at all I, I meant i meant more when i say men, i mean more like the trap men fall into versus the trap women fall into i don't necessarily mean all men are all women because i think sometimes people conflate those things but of yeah. course um, I think so, that, I think that people set different traps depending on gender and race and all that stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, and that that's a whole another part of a bigger discussion. You know, I mean, yeah. the thing is, I'm really hopeful that more people spend time uh, away from their phones and in nature because that that truly is the resource. I've been I've been so ever since the second lockdown happened here. I've been such a couch potato. Like the first, after the first one, I was like, oh, I can do stuff again. You know, like, I mean, outside is always there, but it was during a colder, a colder season. So it wasn't as appealing, but you know, like in the fall, I was like, you know, out and about, but after the second lockdown, I was, I think it just kind of killed my spirit a little bit. Like my, like, where it's like, they're just going to lock everything down again. Why am I, <laughs> why am I going to leave this? I'm not going to leave this couch and they're going to do that. But now I'm feeling, now I think that I'm making a change. I feel more excited to do these things again, and especially with spring, with spring being here now, you know, spring always, I, I definitely get affected by the seasons. I used, I feel, I feel like such a hypocrite talking about that because I used to talk about how bullshit that was. And then it happened to me. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. It's a real so, yeah. thing. Um, it's a, definitely a real thing. Yeah. And actually I learned that people with my eye color or with darker eye color are more susceptible to it. I have like light brown eyes and people with, you know, brown eyes or, or like very dark brown eyes are much more susceptible to it than people with like blue eyes and stuff. You're going to have to send me those studies because the people that I know that are very susceptible to it all have light eyes. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that might come from the fact that, and this is a big giant speculative stretch here, but do you think that might come from the fact that because society values those traits as more attractive, they're often defined by their physical traits more in a way where their self-worth has not been, been integrated enough that they, fuck that, that's way too much of a job. Uh, I think that what it comes from is that people who have light eyes typically come from the north in which the winters are darker and longer. That's true. Actually, I, I, I did read somewhere else, and I'll have to confirm this, but I did read that blue eyes actually were a mutation as a result of like super super ancient incest <laughs> i don't know all i know is i have dark brown eyes both Tell that to have, Hitler. have light <laughs> um but yeah like uh i know the red hair is a mutation i do know that um that that's a mutation so some sometimes when i've been dating and i've, I've told girls that i'm a mute they're like what? And I'm like, it's not what you think. <laughs> um, but like, if, like I've been, I remember, um, I remember the, I went to a movie, into an X-Men movie. And after, after the movie, I told this, this girl, I was like, you know, I'm a mutant. And she was like, what? I was like, yeah. Like, like I, I, so I'm not kidding. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, well. Um, but yeah. All right. Jenna, it's been great talking to you. Um, you know, we should definitely, I'd love to have you on again. Um, where can people find you if they want to find you and how can people vote for you after the, after we talk <laughs> this big game about how much we don't care about that? Right. Well, once again, it's not about me. It's all about Nachan. Um, right. You guys, you guys can find me. Uh, my IG handle is G de la Chine, G D E L A C H E S N A Y E. And then, Jenna Delachene, uh Facebook, and then I've got three different websites. <laughs> okay, I, I I have a feeling you're probably going to start condensing those. Well, they're all linked to each other. One is oh, okay, photography, okay. one is Nachan, and then one is my own personal website. That's my business. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense because I've been finding that I've I, I started my creative identity before I finally started identifying as myself 
um, was so it had become so splintered that it was hard for me to keep track of. Although you don't see, you don't identify as anyone but yourself. But I've now, as a result, I have so many different social media profiles that I don't want to pay attention to. That I'm trying to find a way just to, because I don't want to be, you know, like this the whole time. Um, yeah, yeah. That I'm just trying to find a way to bring them all and lump them together as much as I can. Yeah, so mine I'm, are very lumped together. They're okay, very, good, they're good. very cohesive. Very well, you're also doing a lot more than I am. <laughs> well, for now. Yeah, for now. Hopefully. Um, well, not hopefully. I mean, I don't know. Inshallah. Yeah, exactly. Inshallah. Yeah, and Ramadan's coming up. And I'm actually going to, that's another thing I'm doing. I, I've decided to, I think I'm going to try to participate in Ramadan just because, hey, I'm at a point where my lenience has started to turn into indulgence when it comes to my fit, to my physique. Mm -hmm. And Ramadan starts tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, let's just kill two birds with one stone. I get to explore a new spiritual tradition or spirit well yeah i get to explore a new spiritual tradition rooted in islam and if i start working out during it maybe i can trim down a little bit and start getting my body to look the way sure my i had a lot of my fight family um are muslim and they i was amazed that they would train as hard as they did and not eat until sundown right and intermittent yeah. fasting is now a thing though so it's like becoming a strategy isn't it except i think that's a little that's two meals a day right ramadan they don't eat anything um, oh, I was talking about intermittent fasting. And intermittent, you know, that's such a weird term because people are like, "Are you? Do you have you ever tried this?" And I'm like, "Well, what are you talking about?" And they're like, "Well, you know, where you don't eat after nine, and then you don't." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's normal." Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, that's what that. I thought it was just you eat a lot in the morning, and you eat a lot in the evening, and you don't eat all day, and you. Yeah, that is normal. But that's normal. It's just not even a third meal. Yeah, it's just not even a third meal. And for me, like, I don't, I try not to eat after nine. And then I wake up and I practice and I work with clients. And then I usually don't eat until afternoon. And so in that way, that's intermittent fasting. But that's normal for me. Yeah, I used to, when I was still engaging in exercise, I, I, um, I uh, basically... I, I would eat basically three meals a day, occasionally snack, but that was about it. I wasn't super into, you know, hardcore dieting and nutrition, but it was enough that I could maintain. Um, yeah, and but, some, people, some people are better at grazing. Like I keep like tomatoes and blueberries on the counter and whenever I pass by, I'll grab a couple of handfuls. And Right. Once the second lockdown happened, I just basically said, screw diet, screw nutrition. I'm just doing whatever I need to do to get through this. And so I, I ate well after nine. Sometimes there were times where I ate after midnight, you know, yeah. and I didn't, that was not normal for me. But like I said, I think that there's a time to be kind to yourself. And then once it starts to feel indulgent, which is what it's starting to feel. Luckily, I have this thing in my mind where it kind of tells me this doesn't feel good anymore. This just feels very self-defeating. This doesn't feel like it's a relief for you anymore. It feels like it's a habit. So you need to, change this right. right right you know and I even have that with the gym like there's mm -hmm. time where after three hours I'm like okay Jenna you really need to go home now right you know? right because I'd rather be at the gym than like clean my office right exactly you know I've actually one thing I've noticed um during this during this these COVID times is the people who haven't sort of embraced the uh the change in routine they've become so hardwired into their own routines that they're they're reliant onto it to a point where it has become i think to some one extent or another toxic even if it's supposedly a quote-unquote healthy habit uh -huh. you know That's, so I think, it can happen with anything yeah and that buddhism teaches that it teaches that over attachment to anything is bad yeah the middle path, middle path. right exactly yeah. yeah um all right thank you so much jenna um You're we'll stay welcome. in touch and uh you know um, I'll definitely vote for you now that I found out that I can vote for people and and buy votes. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just do a few poses and get it on the competition somehow if I can buy votes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, you it know. was a lot of fun. Thank you. No problem. Have a great night. Thanks. You too. Bye.